Uh, a very, 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 very good day to all you beautiful people out there in Zoom land. Uh, in case you don't know where you are, I would like to remind you and welcome you to City Lights Live, uh, the uh, City Lights events that are now happening on Zoom instead of upstairs in the cool poetry room. Um, but that, 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 that's where we're at now, as you all very well know. Um, so it, this is wonderful to see you all uh, here with us tonight to celebrate a very special event. Um, Omar El Akkad's new book, What Strange Paradise, yes, published by Alfred Knopf. And we're honored, so very honored to have its author, Omar, with us tonight. Um, his book, can, can I dish a little bit, people? Can I dish? This book just got an amazing write-up in the New York Times and is getting rave reviews all over the place. Uh, Omar El Akkad is an author and a journalist. He has reported from Afghanistan, Guantanamo Bay, and many other locations around the world. His work earned Canada's National Newspaper Award for Investigative Journalism and the Golf Penny Award for Young Journalists. Omar's writing has appeared in The Guardian, Le Monde, Guernica, GQ, and many other newspapers and magazines all around the world. Yeah, his debut novel, American War, is an international bestseller and has been translated into 13 languages. It won the Pacific Northwest Book Release, Book Sell, excuse me, Booksellers Association Award the Oregon Book Award for Fiction, and the Kobo Emerging Writing Prize. and has been nominated for more than 10 other awards. It was listed as one of the best books of the year by the New York Times, the Washington Post, GQ, NPR, and Esquire, and was selected by the BBC as one of the 100 novels that shaped our world. Ihole. Joining Omar in conversation, very special guest, editor Tim O'Connell. He is the senior editor over there at Alfred Knopf. And, um, this is gonna be so good, I'm so excited. Um, let me just tell everyone very quickly, uh, there's gonna be a Q&A at the end of this session. So if you have any questions uh, for Omar or for Tim, uh, please do us a favor and put it in the chat function and we'll get to the uh, questions at the end of the uh, conversation tonight around 5.45, 5.50. All right, y'all. Now without further, further ado, please uh, give a warm, warm Zoom Mundo welcome to uh, Omar El Akkad and Tim O'Connell. Excellent. Uh, cheers, cheers, Jose. I really appreciate that intro. And hello, Omar. It is, uh, it is always good to see you, no matter the venue or the style. Um, I think we both want to do one thing before we do anything else. And I just want to say, like, I'm terrible, like, I'm just very honored to be doing an event with City Lights, uh, the bookstore shaped my life on many different occasions. I've walked into it um, at many different ages uh, and it never ever failed to, to leave me a little changed when I left. And so to be able to do this now means means an immense amount to me. Um, Omar, do you wanna echo those statements? Not at all. I can't stand City Lights, worst bookstore <laughs> I've ever been in. Um, Not life changing at all. <laughs> I, I once, I, this, is, this is a true story, I once drove all the way from Toronto to San Francisco to, to go to City Lights. The purpose of the road trip was to go see City Lights. It is my, um, my all-time greatest bookstore. Um, and yes, it is, it is an honor to be, to be involved with this place. Um, Paul and everyone there have been so kind. Um, and before I move on, Tim, thank you for doing this. Um, it really means a lot. Um, for those of you who don't know Tim, uh, besides being one of the finest editors in the world, uh, responsible for the widest spectrum of books, uh, Jim Carrey's novel, uh, Interior Chinatown, the book that won the, 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 the National Book Award, um, he also has the most incompre incomprehensibly uh, fascinating social life. Every time I go visit this man in New York and I just say, what have you been up to? I, I am I, I I am met with something that sounds like I don't know if you've ever seen the Stefan sketch on SNL. It's just like, yeah, I was at New York's hottest bar. It's in a blimp. The DJ is Abraham Lincoln's ghost. Like, he has, he has a, he's far more interesting than I am. Um, and so I don't I don't know what it is you're canceling to to be here, but I'm sure it is endlessly fascinating, and I'm grateful that you're here. So thank you for that. I, that's very I, I, that's very um, flattering of you, Omar. It means it means a lot to me. I'm canceling going to bed at 9 p.m. as I now do. Uh, so you've ruined my dreams. 
<laughs> Quite literally. <yes. laughs> um, it was an honor to work with you on this book and likewise on America more, but you know, What Strange Paradise, um, at, at the outset, I remember reading the first pages when they came in and talking with, with Sonny and others and saying uh, that it had represented this sort of immense leap um, in your capacity to, to, to decode some of the most essential things about, about humanity, about the way we move across the world and about what's going on now, um, you know, politically, uh, just interpersonally and what might happen in the future. And it was something uh, that I won't forget. And now that we've seen it into the world and, and after all the great work you did on it to see some of these reviews that Josiah mentioned, and I'm gonna read a couple of them just because you mentioned my social life. Um, this first one is from Ron Charles at the Washington Post. Um, he said, riveting, nothing I've read before has given me such a visceral sense of the grisly predicament confronted by millions of people expelled from their homes by conflict and climate change. That's the first of three I wanna read. The second comes from Gabino Iglesias from NPR. Hope and kindness light the story in unexpected ways. Elikah's precise prose allows him to inject heartfelt observations throughout the novel. Perhaps Elikah's biggest accomplishment with What Strange Paradise is that it manages to push past political talking points and shocking statistics to rehumanize the discussion about migration on a global scale, and it does so with enough heart to be memorable. And then my, my final, and you know, this is just the New York Times book review, and um, this is Wendell Stevenson saying, um, extraordinary, told from the point of view of two children on the ground and at sea, the story so astutely unpacks the us versus them dynamics of our divided world that it deserves to be an instant classic. I haven't loved a book this much in a long time. And that's just a sampling. And I chose those three, not simply because of the prominence about where they are, but they also sort of lead us in um, a little bit to talking about the subject of the book. Um, and there's one thing I want to start with, and I, and, I, and I want to talk about the inspiration of it, but I wanted to mention the name of Alan Curdy, because I think something that we discussed early on is um, so often people will forget the actual name of a person who died tragically and um, seeking refuge. And this, of course, is the young boy, young Syrian boy who was part of that iconic image of, of a laying on the beach who had passed away on a Greek beach. And um, I wanted to just maybe use that as, as a jumping off point, just to hear a little bit about your initial kernels for this book um, and how that started to unspool when you, when you met the page. Yeah, um, thank you for that, first of all. Um, it's, um, it was strange when, when those reviews first came out, I got an email from my agent effectively saying like, well, I didn't see that coming, which was a great vote of confidence, you know, <laughs> like, really? Um, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but um, I, I, so the earliest memory I have of, of sort of something that got me thinking about the amorphous blob that would eventually become the book um, predates that image by, by a couple of years. I was in, uh, I was in Egypt, uh, it was 2012. And I was covering the aftermath of the Arab Spring. And uh, so I was born in Egypt. Uh, I lived there until I was five. And then I, I grew up in the Middle East in Qatar and we'd go back and forth. All, all my extended family dating back many, many generations are all, um, are all Egyptian. And so I was driving around town one night with a friend of mine from high school and uh, he was complaining about like the most universal thing anyone can complain about, uh, rents. The rents were too high. And so at one point I asked, you know, so, okay, what's, what's like the rent for an, apart for an apartment in your building? And he says, um, well, do you mean the locals price or do you mean the Syrians price? I said, well, what the hell is the Syrians price? And he said, well, we've been having a lot of these folks coming down here and they don't really have much choice. Uh, so they get charged three times as much. I mean, what are they going to do? Go somewhere else? Um, and it became clear that this wasn't just an apartments thing. This was across the board. You know, you go down and buy fruits and vegetables from the stall down the street. and It's, it's likely to be something similar. Um, and I was thinking about this in the context of, you know, 
the, the, the governments in my part of the world where I grew up constantly standing up and saying, you know, our sisters, our Syrian brothers and sisters, our Syrian brothers, the same way they've been doing, you know, for decades with our Palestinian brothers and sisters, and, and it's all nonsense. Uh, on the ground level, there was a population that was fit to be exploited, so they were going to exploit them. Um, and so I was thinking a little bit about that, and then uh, about a year later, I think maybe a year and a half, um, I was reading the story about a migrant shipwreck, a shipwreck in the Mediterranean, and, and the details were about as grotesque as you would, you would imagine for something like that. What struck me the most in hindsight was, was that that particular shipwreck was the subject of immense outrage and news articles and so on and so forth for about 24 hours. And then everybody moved on um, to whatever the next thing was. And so in the context of that picture, which is seared into my head, um, it, was, it was not just like the, the sort of blatant injustice of what you were seeing and the kind of evidence it presented of, of the kind of sickness that we have developed as a society. It was also the fact that you knew that the immense outrage this thing generated was gonna be bordered by the next thing that generated that much outrage. And more than anything, West Strange Paradise is sort of written against that idea. It's written against that privilege of instantaneous forgetting, this idea that it is enough to just be sufficiently outraged at the thing and then move on to be sufficiently outraged at the next thing. Um, so those were the two moments that kind of started me thinking about what several years later became this book. I want to I want to ask you to read something in a second because a I like how it talks about um, Egypt and just having you talk about being from there and your family's history to it. And also there's some kernels of some of the things you're just saying in it. Um, but isn't that kind of what um, you were a journalist as well? You know, you covered the Arab Spring. You you cover. I believe, if I'm correct, you, you cover gun violence in America, right? So you're being assaulted literally in the, mentally each day with, with violence and tragedy. And I thought when we were first early on in our relationship um, and your, your instinct to turn to fiction, um, particularly because I think it has that more lasting power, right? This novel, it causes you to slow down maybe a little bit. Yeah, it's, it's, I remember the first time I met you guys, I went down to New York. This was shortly after uh, Sonny had decided to buy American War. And we met in one of those conference rooms. And uh, the, the first meeting with editors generally, for those of you who've never had the experience, is uh, one of the most demoralizing things. Because <laughs> you go in and they've, they've bought the damn book. So you think they must love me. They must love the book. This is going to be great. Um, it's going to be like that intro Tim gave where he reads all the positive reviews. It's going to be a love fest. And instead, what you get is about two to three hours of just a rundown, a very detailed rundown of everything that's wrong with, with what you've written and, and given to you by people who know what the hell they're talking about. So it's even more demoralizing because you can't argue against any of it. Um, but then at the end of that, I was, I was still working as a journalist at the time, actually. And, and I was used to a certain kind of framing of, of what a story is and how long it takes. You know, in a newspaper, it's like, get it to us two hours ago. And at the end of this meeting, it was basically like, okay, we'll see you in six months. Does that sound about right? And nobody in my history of writing had ever said, see you in six months. It was, it was this immense psychological whiplash of, of like six months. Well, I'm still going to do it the night before, right? Like that's still what's going to happen. I'm going to waste five months and 29 days and then um, it was it was a very strange thing, but but that's the mode I think you operate in when you're putting something out that's not going to be used to wrap fish two days later, sort of thing. Um, and your readers are forced to slow down a little bit too, though, right? Like there's something about, and I would encourage people to go and 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 get this sort of beautiful physical thing from <laughs> City Lights being reopened. But there's something like about spending time with a story and character. Um, in a way that in fiction, that's a little bit different, I think, than um, in journalism, maybe. Yeah, I think so. I think it, it is, the slowness is, is a different way of, you know, you set yourself up as a prism to, to, for this thing to pass through and it's, it's a much slower transmission. Um, but also it's, it's a much more uncertain one, I think. I mean, in journalism by definition, you need answers. Uh, if you don't have answers to who, what, where, when, how, you don't have a work of journalism. Um, Right. And so, you know, 10 years of doing this, 
you're left with all of these residual effects, residual memories, experiences, things that you can't put down, or at least I don't have the talent to put down in a work of journalism because I can't mold them into the form of an answer. I can't mold them into anything remotely prescriptive. Um, and so that's where I go to fiction for, is a sort of the uncertainty. Uh, American War was like this, What Strange Paradise is like this. There's no answer at the end. Um, mm. And so for me, it's that place. It's the grounds to sort of rid myself of this kind of anvil that you're carrying around of, of uncertainty and kind of questioning. I think we should, let's, given that we just sort of launched right into talking about um, working, literally, let's give these folks um, a little bit of a flavor of the book. And, you know, I, I won't say too much other than it's sort of a parallel journey. And you, you're sort of seeing um, where, we'll, you know, if you start at start the beginning of chapter six, maybe, um, and we meet, we meet Amir here. Uh, we meet, we meet the young boy who, who is, um, is, is uh, inadvertently stepping onto a ship um, migrant ship that's going to meet a certain fate. Yeah, so so the, the, the book opens, the first page is on, you, there's a child who's a survivor of a shipwreck uh, on a Mediterranean, uh, across the Mediterranean on a Western island, and then the book alternates be, between before and after chapters. The after chapters are everything that happens once he arrives on the island, and the before chapters, <clears throat> excuse me, are the lead up to that. So this is one of the before chapters. <clears throat> excuse me. Amir lay awake in bed, listening. A little after midnight, he heard footsteps in the hall. He eased from his bed and crept to the door. He saw a quiet uncle walking out, the bedroom, out, out of the bedroom down the hall, his steps light and careful, fluent in the places where the floorboards creaked. He wore plain gray pants and a simple work shirt, both recently ironed. Amir watched as his uncle typed something on his phone and then softly easing the front door open, left the house. Once years earlier, Amir's father told him that none of this started with bombs or bullets or a few stupid kids spray painting the slogans of revolution on the walls. It started with a drought. You come from farmers, he said, and five years before you were born, the earth turned on us, the earth withheld. We are the products of that withholding. Every man you ever meet is nothing but the product of what is withheld from him, what he feels owed. Don't call this a conflict, Amir's father said. There's no such thing as conflict. There's only scarcity. There's only need. Amir looked down the hall to the other bedroom where his mother and half brother lay sleeping. Then he followed quiet uncle out the front door. A year of experience had taught Amir that Egyptians did their living exclusively at night. He stayed well back of his uncle, unnoticed among the vendors of roasted peanuts and charred corn and all the people out walking along the corniche. Entire, family, entire families whose respite from the drudgery of the workday was to be outside, to simply exist. Everywhere around him, music played and car horns blared and conversations collided, the city over full with living. He followed for an hour until Amir saw a quiet, quiet uncle turn onto a pier at which only a single aging ferry was docked. Two old men sat at the entrance to the pier and before them a long line of people waited to board. The men appeared to be guards of a sort, talking to each person in line before letting them through or turning them away. Some of the people waved printed sheets of paper while others showed things on their cell phone screens and others simply offered cash. Slowly, the queue moved in the direction of the waiting vessel. I love that um, <clears throat> so much. Uh, mostly, I mean, because of, you know, there, there is this profound moment of there is no such thing as conflict. There is only scarcity. There is only need. Um, which, and, and Amir's father is this sort of voice who sort of um, kind of exists. You don't, you never really meet him. He always just kind of comes in and he gives this, these, these perspectives about like what is taking place and what causes people um, to flee or to go somewhere to hope for, for something better. Um, but I think this line, Amir, uh, that Egyptians did their living exclusively at night is one of the best things I've ever read because it just gives this 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 
portrait of, of a place um, that felt so lush and uh, authentic, and yet right on the edge of it is the ship that is tiered basically by money and region um, about to set off on this, on this, uh, on this journey, right? And I, I wonder uh, when you were writing Amir's character, uh, what, what it was like to sort of look at the, the world from, from his perspective. So there's, there's at least one Egyptian on this call right now. Um, or one person who spent a considerable amount of time in Egypt. So at some point I will check in with her to see if that made any sense at all. Um, <laughs> or if it's just my, my very distorted recollections. I mean, I remember one of the last times I was in Egypt, um, you know, your family, they, they, they see you for the first time in years and they know it's gonna be years until they see you again. So there's a sort of very concentrated generosity that's gonna happen. You're gonna gain 30 pounds, you're not gonna sleep, you're going to go to weird places uh, all of the time. Um, and at one point, they decided they wanted to show me a particular beach. I don't know where the hell this place was. It must have been up north by Alexandria, but it's like a two hour drive. And, and we're going and they immediately get lost. There's no, there's no real like streets. That, that, that doesn't work. Google Maps is not doing a great job in, in Egypt, particularly in these parts we're going to. Anyway, we're driving and um, at one point, we sort of veer too close to what appears to be a military base or something. Anyway, there's like a checkpoint in the middle of the highway. And this is deserted. There's no lights. There's no nothing. Just this checkpoint, a bunch of soldiers. And we pull up and we're like, what the hell? We're not at the border. Like, we're not getting, we're not getting to Israel. There's no way. And, um, and the soldier, like, gets us to roll down the window. And he's like, uh, where are you from? And my cousin, who's doing the speaking exclusively because... If I start speaking right now, you will know that I'm Egyptian, but you also know that I left Egypt when I was five. It's very, very broken sort of. So my cousin's doing all the talking and he says, um, he says, we were just going trying to look for this beach. And, and he's like, where are you from? He's like, we're, we're from Egypt. Like you can tell from by my voice, we're from Egypt. He's like, no, you're Israelis. And suddenly like the mood in the car shifts because if you know anything about that part of the world, an Egyptian soldier telling you, no, you're Israelis is not the start of a fun thing that's going to happen, right? Mm. Um, and so my cousin immediately as a reflex does the most Egyptian thing possible. He says, uh, not only am I Egyptian, my father's a high court judge. <laughs> and the guy's look just immediately changed. He says, sir, please go, do go this way. We're just closed because there's a military base down the road, but please, it doesn't check, like it doesn't call his bluff or anything. Cause like, what, what if he's right? And in fact, he was right. My, my cousin's dad is, is a high court judge. Anyway, a huge chunk of that memory eventually made it into one of the scenes in this book um, when, they're, when they're trying to cross just the, the like the malice and how quickly you find out that the malice has no load bearing beam. It's just the person doing it because he can. Um, there's a lot of that in authority built into institutional authority in the Arab world, uh, not just Egypt, but almost everywhere I've been in the Arab world. There's that kind of like, I can do this, so I will. Well, um, and, and Amir gets to kind of the, the journey of the ship is a microcosm of, of this very thing, right? Because there are people from all different parts of the Arab world. And then there's Mohammed, right? Who's, who's, who's basically trying, he's sort of the law in his way, right? He's this one of the smugglers. Um, and that you were able to do that in such a finite space um, is, is incredible. For those of you who end up buying this book, if you hate it, uh, Tim is more to blame than I am. I gave him many drafts um, that might have been better than the final one. I don't know. He's he's the one who who vetoed them. Um, actually, there, there was there was this that key change that at one point one of the earlier drafts I had those monologues from the people on the boat, and it clearly wasn't working at a structural sense. But but it was. I, I lived with those folks for a while in my head, yeah. and um, I have that relationship where I don't agree with pretty well anything any of my characters have to say. Uh, that's true in American War and also in, in What Strange Paradise. Um, but they, they- That's fascinating. They, do you feel like they start to, um, do you feel like, and this is for, I, you know, at book readings, there tend to be a lot of writers. Um, and I think, and you guys who are out there, if you, you can ask questions at any time and Omar and I can kind of just fold them in and we could talk about them. I know I try to keep it a little looser, but I, I was gonna say like, 
do you feel like your characters are starting, you know, are they kind of start to speak for themselves a little bit in this situation? I, I'm always worried about, once they say something that I agree with, I'm worried about the echo chamber taking hold and sort of my natural insecurity kicks in and says, we are, is this person just repeating what, what you want them to say? Right. Um, which I mean is, is, you know, the places where the dialogue is clunky, it's pretty clear that I have a line that I want somebody to say. Right. This is the case with, with all of my fiction, short stories, everything. It's, it's, I have to watch for those places where I very clearly want someone to say something that, that means a lot to me. Um, <laughs> but they, I mean, I, I do snippets. I don't do whole people, but I do snippets from people I know. So there's, there's a one character on, on, on the boat, this guy named Welid, who's a coward. He, he's at his, at his core, he's a coward. Mm -hmm. um, but he has this immense sense of pride. And so even as he's, he's manifesting this cowardice in the most sort of overt, ridiculous ways on, on this boat, he's still holding on to the, um, to, to the kind of sense that he's bigger than all of this, that this is all a horrible mistake, that he's actually a member of a far higher class than, than anyone on this boat. And it, and it all sort of is clearly violated by reality. But I think, I think at its core, What Strange Paradise is a book about the collision of two fantasies. It was a fantasy that a lot of folks on my part of the planet have that the West is nirvana. You get to the West and everything sorts itself out. Right. Which in some ways is true, right? Like I can say whatever the hell I want now without worrying about the secret police coming to my door. There's a lot of things wrong with this country, but that's not one of them. Um, but in another way, it's completely, it's a complete fantasy. And then it collides with the fantasy headed in the other direction of, you know, this, this sort of Western fantasy of all those people over there are barbarians at the gate. And we have to do anything to keep them out, even if that means burning the whole place down, just so they don't get their hands on it. And so you have these dueling fantasies and reality is subservient to them both. Right. Yeah, what, what actually is doesn't matter in the slightest. Um, and obviously the book structurally is, is written that way where reality takes a backseat to, to these fantasies. Well, yeah, well, there's so much interesting stuff to talk about and some of the decisions that were made along the way about that, which are, are fascinating. And Paul has asked us a very easy question, but before, I, before we answer it, I think, um, which you could see in the chat, and I'll read it aloud for everybody here, but then Omar, maybe read the beginning of chapter nine, um, that section from the after, just so we can get Vana and Kethros sort of in the room, Vanya, just so we can have them here a little bit. And then after we talk a little bit about that, we have to answer Paul's question, of course. Um, can you unspool the chronology of the conversation and getting to a final manuscript from both your perspectives? <laughs> Paul wants to get into a fight. <laughs> he's like, we he's should like, go into different breakout rooms. Seen? <laughs> and then like you do yours and I'll do mine and we'll see if they at all match up. Yeah, we'll see if they line up. He's like, you know what these guys need to do? They need to pepper this conversation up a little bit. <laughs> but read read this one section of Vana of because I love <clears throat> and I want I want people who are here to kind of think about what we were seeing um when we were just seeing the world through through Amir's eyes. He was just about to leave this place and step onto a pretty a, 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 a dark situation, literally, because they're they're in this vessel that's traveling across um, the Mediterranean with with no no um, no real light. Um, bear with me. Earlier today, my daughter, for no good reason, asked me to tell her <clears throat> the story of Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves, <laughs> which turned into this two-hour sort of. I, I got about halfway through the story and then realized that that story gets real dark, um, <laughs> so I had to sort of start inventing. So anyway, my voice is not what it normally is. Um, so yeah, this is, uh, there's two central characters in the book. There's, there's uh, Vana, this girl, teenage girl who lives on the island, and Amir, the little boy who shows up on the island. And this is uh, one of the after chapters uh, involving uh, Vana. At the Hotel Xenius, the poolside restaurant is crowded, but free of its usual cacophony. The tourists sit under beach umbrellas, picking at their food, and nursing elaborate tropical drinks. Vanna overhears little snippets of conversation about the wreck on the beach. The incident has ruined the tourists' day, confining them to the grounds of their hotel. She hears a middle-aged couple argue about whether to demand a refund. After she pays for four cheeseburgers, she crosses the path back to the main road that leads to her home. At the intersection, she finds her sandals where she left them the thin foam hot against her soles after an hour in the midday sun. 
not far from where the dirt path ends, Vanna sees two military trucks come up the road from the direction of her home. She recognizes the vehicles as those used by the loose assortment of military, police, and Coast Guard officers charged with chasing down those who wash up on the island's shore alive. She stops and watches them pass. The lead truck slows as it, as it nears her. The passenger side window rolls down. She recognizes immediately the broad, handsome face of the man who's been chosen to lead the island's efforts at rounding up the illegals, her mother's old friend, Colonel Dimitri Kethros. What have you got there, he asks, smiling and pointing to the plastic bag in her hand. Just lunch, Vanna replies. Bought it from the Xenius for mom and dad. Smells good. I don't suppose you bought any extra by any chance. No, Vanna says, just for the three of us. Kethros eyes the bag in her hand, and for a moment she thinks she, he can see into it somehow. But he can tell she's lying, and from this lie will deduce exactly what she's up to. He has that look about him, of a man in possession of exactly as much information as he needs. He is one of the largest men on the island, not fat and only a little taller than most, but well-built, solid in a way she associates with military men, even though many of the soldiers dispatched to the island are scrawny and barely out of their teens. In the thick straightness of his jawline and the width of his shoulders, the inverted triangle of him, he seems to have been built to excel, to excel at work that demands uniform and insignia. But he also has a charming smile. And this, more than any other facet of what he projects to the world, is what Vanna distrusts the most. Yeah, that's great. I've always loved that scene. Um, and for, for those who, who, who haven't read the book, the hamburgers are very significant because um, currently Vanna has been told to go get lunch for her mother, her father, and herself. Um, but she's also kind of harboring Amir who, who has survived the shipwreck, right? And we learned that earlier, it's not much of a spoiler, but he survived, he survived and she's going back. Um, she's bringing food back and she's brought him a hamburger as well. And she runs into Kethros and he's charming. You know, and what I love so much about that scene is, you know, you made him a remarkably complex character. All the characters in this book, from the youngest to the oldest, everybody you meet, they're um, they're charming and they're complex and they're they're put into this world uh, that you've created. These clashing fantasies, right, and this this kind of space in between where people have to kind of make decisions or are forced into certain situations. Um, and I just always thought the hamburgers really showed that very well. So thank you for reading that. But it also shows it also shows how smart Vana is immediately. Um, and this is the setup for for everyone here. Like this is kind of these are the recipes and the characters and the actions and the, the sort of people that are going to go on uh, essentially two parallel journeys. And it's it's done so in not much space. It's remarkably economical, um, what you were able to do. And I think that structure, that before and after structure, when we, when we kind of got to that, really unlocked so much um, to, in order for the flow of the book. I mean, I guess this sort of speaks to, to, to Paul's question a bit, like, uh, how long, <laughs> how long was it from, uh, I should know this, but I don't, but how long did we work on this? I would say about a year and a half. Yeah, that makes a lot. That makes a lot of sense. And I'm not. I'm not counting the the point at which we got to sort of you know line edits and this comma is missing. You know that that kind of thing. I'm, I'm counting yeah. the stuff where, um, you know, I, and and I mean like if if there's if there's anything good in this book, I, I'm supposed to be a salesman here, and I'm supposed to come out and tell you that it's the best thing you've ever read, and and and, and all the rest of that. Um, and I can't do that. I don't have the capacity to do that. But if there's anything that works in it, uh, Tim's fingerprints are all over this because. Uh, as much as I bug him about his insane social life, again, <laughs> I, I can't I can't stress that enough. Um, he not only edited the hell out of this thing, but he did so under incredibly difficult circumstances. I mean, a week after I handed in what ended up being the third last draft, uh, Sonny Mehta died. Sonny Mehta is the guy who bought this book. He's the guy who bought American War. Um, he's someone who, to put it very mildly had a huge influence on both Tim and myself, Tim more so, Tim's known him for much, much longer. And, and, and he passed away and it was, 
at least for me, the, the flavor immediately went away from that part of my life. Not, not just the publishing part, but the writing part and all of it. Um, and I think everyone at the Penguin Random House building in New York had, had, had something similar happen. And so you're under those circumstances and, and you're trying to work on this thing. Um, and, and yeah, you, I mean, the, the editing notes are, if there's anything that works here, it's as a result of that. Um, I remember we went, at, we went at that before and after thing for a while about mm -hmm. having the before and after chapters. The chapters, because this is a reinterpretation of Peter Pan, at least in my mind, it's Peter Pan reinterpreted as the story of a contemporary child refugee. Initially, it, it I, I really wanted to weld it to that work. Like right now, if you pick up this book and you're not intimately familiar with Peter Pan, you're probably not going to see, you know, Colonel Kethros is clearly the Captain Hook character and you know, that sort of thing. But uh, it had the same number of chapters as the original Peter Pan, and that clearly wasn't working. It was it was contrived, uh, and you saw through that and sort of. We went at that for about a year and a half until we yeah. until we got to this place. Yeah, that sounds about right. I mean, we read it when it first came in. My Sonny uh, was able to read it with him, which was remarkable. And I think he saw it through one or two drafts. And then we kind of, at that third draft, we kind of were on our own. Um, I think maybe we did two, maybe three more, and then it was copy edited. I mean, the funny thing is, um, first of all, I know he would love where this book came to um, because all those things about seeing um, artifice and structure and adhering to something when you're trying to make it, when you're really making something your own, you know, if there, if there was anything about Sonny is he could look at you and he, was, he had the ultimate bullshit detector. It was terrifying. I remember when we were editing, when we were editing uh, American War, did I tell you this story? It was because you had, you had four editors on American War. You had me, you had Edward Castamari, and Andrew Ridker, and you had Sonny. And Sonny had brought us all in. That's how exact, like, that's how excited he was about the book. So we had all read it. He calls us up to his office. We're sitting in front of him. He's sitting there smoking. Um, and he starts asking us questions. <laughs> um, and it's more plot stuff. It's character stuff. And we're answering them. And I, I feel like we're doing a great job. And then he says... Uh, Sarah, there's, this is the moment where she's about to assassinate someone. And he goes, what was the name of the rifle? <laughs> and I looked at him, I was like, you're just fucking with us now. <laughs> I was like, that's just, you're just, now you really are taking pleasure just watching us try to figure it out. It was, it was fascinating, but he, um, what I did, and what I think a lot of people did, um, you know, because that was that was an, that was a, it was a hard transformative time globally for publishing. But uh, I turned to it was like I, there's the one thing I know I can do right now, and the one thing I know that he would want me to do is to edit this book with as much care and attention as possible. Um, and then we really got to it, and it was great. It was really it was really meaningful in that, and I just see it now, and then just to sort of watch it taking shape. I mean, the way it looks and just the difference too, in some ways, like what I always loved about this was American War um, is iconic in ways um, that are completely different from this book. And I love that when it came time for you to send your next book in, it wasn't like remotely the same. The themes are very, there's so much overlap in terms of like movement and need and power and, you know, and resource, right? but the books are totally different. And that was the coolest thing for me um, in terms of, you know, when we first read it. So I guess, I don't, you know, from the day it was submitted to the day to now, it was probably three years. I don't even, I should know, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it was something like that. Um, and it was, it was a weird three years. I mean, it was, you know, <laughs> what was happening in the world generally was, was, was weird as hell. And um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it was, it was, it was a scary thing, right? Because the, the, you know, there is a part of you, when I wrote American War, I had, I had no publisher. I had no agent. I had no book deal. To speak. I had no expectation this thing would ever see the light of way. And in fact, the light of day. And in fact, it stayed on, on my hard drive for about four months. Uh, I wrote three novels before that that I didn't think were any good. Um, and I, and I, was, I was very, very scared to, to show anybody any of American War. 
How did you uh, connect with, with Anne McDermott then? Anne McDermott is, is Omar's agent and she's amazing and legendary in her own right. But um, how, yeah, how did you guys hook up? So I had met her randomly in Toronto eight years earlier. And over the course of, so at the beginning of my journalism career, and then um, she would just send me one email a year, like a Christmas greeting or something like, hey, how's it going? The thing that agents are really good at, right? Which is the like, just in case you turn out not to be completely useless, like I'm just gonna keep, you know, and it was that sort of thing. And, and so I actually, so American War had been sitting on the hard drive for about four months. And um, I had a bad day at work. Uh, I had a day where I felt like I was just rewriting press releases. Mm. And so I got off the phone with the managing editor at, at the Globe at the time, like this awful conversation where it was clear, like this was never going to change. We don't have the budget to send you anywhere to do the stories you want, you know, that sort of conversation. And I hung up the phone. I thought to hell with this. So I emailed Dan and I said, listen, I know it's every uh, agent's worst nightmare when a journalist says I have a novel for you, but I have a novel for you. Would you mind taking a look? And she said, sure, send it over. So I emailed it over. And then three days later, she emails me and says, uh, I really like this. I think I know who would be good for it. Uh, his name is Sonny. You should look him up. Right. And so I looked him up. And the first thing that comes up is like this Vanity Fair story. Yeah, like, and like, damn it. <laughs> I was actually I, like, I was not nervous because I was like, oh, we're just wasting our time. Like this is <laughs> nothing. And for three months, just radio silence. And then a single line email that just says like, I like it. Or something yeah uh, and then we got the offer a little while after that it was um i mean i won the lottery in, in every respect um it was yeah, i felt lucky he asked me to read that i read it i read it um he said that to me quickly knowing that i had interest in science fiction and um just you know i think he, he wanted my eye on it for that reason but i read that i read the first draft of that i read it at night um some of which was on my phone. I remember sitting in my old apartment in the in the window back when I used to smoke too. Back when I had a, li a social life that you talk about, <laughs> and I was reading, um, I was reading the novel. And I remember going in the next day. I was like, we have to publish this book. Um, but I want to make sure if there also it's nine fifty one, it's six fifty one. If there are any other questions from anybody else out there, um, they can ask them. Otherwise, you know, you're just going to be stuck with Omar and I talking at one another, which. You know, we'll just do anyway. <laughs> um, but, um, More than happy to do. And I, I, I would encourage folks. Um, it, it, it's uh, I'm very biased. Omar can't be the salesman, but I can tell you, you can pick this book up and um, you read it very fast because you, you can't stop. Um, it's just got an absolute. Well, that's the other thing too, is it has a message to it too. Like you can't stop. And I feel like you're learning something, which was something we set out to do. Um, I mean, I think you always have to do that. Yeah, it's, it's, again, I can't tell you if it's a good or bad book, but it's, um, it, there's, there's things in it. There's things beneath the surface of it um, mm -hmm. that very, that, that it's a different book depending on, on the way you approach it and, and your experiences going into it, I think. Uh, the first four people who read it had four entirely different interpretations of what the hell was happening, which was a strange thing to to deal with. The fir first four reactions I got were were entirely different interpretations than my own, um, and I, I I kind of love that. Yeah, well, there was also that. Well, I don't want to talk too much about it because it's 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 about it's about the latter half of the book, but I think everybody also had different interpretations of a particular section of it too. Yes. Um, which were there were many discussions about. And we'll leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> Tim has a question for you, Tim. Yeah, uh, Omar, uh, Kim M says, I have a question. Can you speak about the role of mothers in the book um, if it's not too spoilery, which I was fascinated by the different representations of mothers. It's an incredible question. Yeah, there, there are um, two very different characters in the before and after chapter, both of whom are mothers and are, are very different human beings. Um, but so much of the book and so much of what I write about generally is about this. I don't, I don't have any answers to this, but I, I do ex spend a lot of my time thinking about what happens to human beings when you strip them of agency. I think we all have this very sort of human desire to have some say over the things we do and the things that are done to us. 
and um, and and my characters and my stories tend to revolve around the ways in which people become damaged when you take that agency away. And so there's Amir's mother, who is this person who, you know, I, I don't I don't write good characters. All my characters are flawed in some some way or another, but she is the closest to that. And she is in this context in in Egypt where they've the family has left their home and they are trying desperately to make a go of it in Egypt. She is trying. Um, she's trying to make a life here. And so one of the things she's doing, for example, is she's watching Egyptian soap operas and she's trying desperately to mimic the accent of the actors because she knows that in other ways she might fit in. You might see her on the street and not be able to differentiate between Syrian and Egyptian, but once she opens her mouth, everybody can tell. So she's trying desperately to, to rid herself of that, to regain that kind of agency. Um, and then on the other side, there's Vanna's mother, um, who is this character who has an entirely different relationship with agency in the sense that she feels in some vague way that her life has been a disappointment, that she didn't get to do the things she wanted to do or be the person she wanted to be, but from a place of immense privilege relative to what Amir's mother is doing. Um, and so these two characters that, that feel entirely different to me um, also have this undercurrent of, of trying to contend in very different ways with not nearly enough agency as they believe they should have. Yeah, that's well put. And it makes, I mean, it, that was something I think we also discussed a lot as we were going through it. And I watched you develop these characters and draw them out with these individual sort of scenes, which is really amazing. Um, there's a question about Mahfouz's Cairo trilogy and whether, and whether he is an influence. He's more than an influence. Um, when my father was very young, he lived in this place in Egypt called uh, El Hussein. El Hussein is one of the, the oldest neighborhoods in Cairo. Uh, you go there now and it's partially kind of a tourist trap. There's a lot of people selling you know, silverware and whatever, but, but, but it's an incredible neighborhood. It has this coffee shop in the middle of it, uh, Ahwit El Fashewi. It's been run by the El Fashewi family for like 200 years. I don't know, I don't know how long it's been. Anyway, Thursday nights, uh, middle of the 20th century, um, uh, the luminaries of Egyptian culture, uh, poets, politicians, actors would all descend on Ehwet al Fashawi, on this coffee shop, to uh, talk about the issues of the day. And at the center of all of this was Naguib Mahfouz. And eventually the evening would deteriorate into a battle of free verse. They would just see who could come up with the greatest poetry on the floor. While all of this was happening, there was this little kid sitting underneath one of the tables listening to all of this, and that's my dad. And Hag al Fashawi, the guy who ran this place, would let the kids hang around until things got too dirty, until like the rhymes started getting too profane, and then he'd shoo them away with a broomstick and my dad would have to go home. Um, that is quite literally the first memory I have of anyone telling me a story, even tangentially related to literature, it was my dad telling me, and he was so proud. He was so exceptionally proud of having been there. Um, and in fact, I recently, I was asked to write the introduction to a new translation of A Thousand and One Nights. Um, and that's the story I led with. It's, it's for me, this idea of transcribing through memory. I mean, there's no, there's no record of these rhymes. There's no record of this poetry. There's no, none of it, except as it existed in my, in my father's head. Um, and I read, I read everything I could get my hands on by Nagi Mahfouz. I went and hunted down uh, Wilad Kharitna, this, this one of his lesser known, or was lesser known, which was a story about kids in an alley Wilad is literally like the children of our alley. Anyway, um, I'm rambling and I apologize, but um, it's, it's a story that seems like one kind of story. There's this thing Sonny once told me when he was talking about American war. He said, uh, you think you're reading one thing, but you're really reading something else. <laughs> and this particular story, after Naguib Mahfouz became very famous after he won the Nobel Prize, the Muslim Brotherhood figured out that it really was the story of the, uh, of the prophets retold and each of these kids represented one of the prophets of the major religions and they lost their minds. Uh, and one day Naguib Mahfouz is walking home. This kid must have been like 18, 19, runs out and stabs him in the neck. And he almost killed him. And in fact, he suffered with the, the health repercussions of that for the rest of his life. Um, and the thing Mahfouz did was he kept up a correspondence with this, with this kid in prison, found out later the kid had never read the book. Had no idea. He'd just been told was, this was heresy. And so he went out. Um, so not only did Mahfouz's work influence me, um, but everything around it. Uh, that man is 
is a sun around an entire sort of solar system of things I think about literature. So anyway, thank you for bringing them up. Yeah, it's a wonderful question. Thank you for that story, Omar. That's incredible. It's an incredible story. Thank you for doing this, Tim. I really, I really appreciate it. Uh, it means a lot. And um, this counts as our one meeting of the year, so you don't have to see me again now. <laughs> well, I wish we could be seeing each other in city lights. Um, you know, that would be the ideal thing. And, and we've been, you know, uh, Josiah, thank you for, for organizing this for us and, you know, and Peter and Paul, like, Hopefully we'll see you guys too. I think I think the dive bar, uh, New York uh, tour would be a, would be a wonderful social event that maybe Omar could join us on. <laughs> and um, yeah, I want to encourage people to please, you know, Omar can't sell the book, but I can. It's fat. It's fabulous. Um, it's it's important, and you'll fall in love with these characters. So I would encourage you to to click the link in the chat or stop by City Lights and, and grab a copy and, and sort of just bask in the beauty of that store because um, we're really lucky to have it. Um, and I, I had a great time. I feel very fortunate and very lucky. So thank you. This is such a wonderful conversation. Uh, gracias, Tim, and gracias, Omar, so much. Uh, people in the Zoom world, show these two amazing folks some love. Uh, you can emoji them, or there's a couple emojis. There we go. There we are. So this is a... This is the way we share feelings these days. It's beautiful. Again, uh, gracias, Tim. Gracias, Omar. And uh, we take that rain check on that. On that, When you all come back to uh, San Francisco, we're going to Vesuvio's and Specs. <laughs> all right. All right. Hey, well, thank you, guys. Have a good night. See you all. all right. Buenas noches. City Lights loves you all. <laughs> <laughs>